and a little bit smaller, but yes, the, the problem with silicon and any of its derivative uh, uh, alloys that are used to make the chips now, and I guess we can get into nanotech now, but I just wanted to... All right, we will, but uh, yeah, let us do it. Uh, you get, let's say you get past a million. What You said things beginning uh, begin to get strange. What do you mean by that? Well, only because now you have thermo thermodynamic problems. Uh, you, you, you can only... If, if we're going to go for top-down manufacturing technology, that is traditionally how chips are made, is for those that aren't familiar, you grow a, a rod of silicon called a rutile, which you then slice into little thin wafers. Mm -hmm. Those wafers are then coated with a photoresistant material onto which you then project a wiring pattern that represents the topographical features of what you're about to create etched into that silicon. And you, you feed it through a series of chemical baths, and the end result being you end up with this bumpy surface. It has a bunch of little troughs and valleys and little wire-like connections that allow the different transistor devices that have been etched into the surface of the material to be interconnected. And what happens is you go through a series of these stages where you go through an etch run, then you deposit a layer of molecules of the next material, then you etch that. And then you go through that sandwiching process several times, mm -hmm. and you find it with, with, the, with the final construction. Uh, below about 0.02 microns, though, you, the roughness of the features, the atomic precision by which you can control how well those features are constructed via this kind of top-down assembly process, it simply doesn't work anymore. And at the same time, if you're trying to cram electrons through a very, very small junction size where the actual number of atoms, you have to have a statistical population that says you can have a certain amount of thermal noise and a certain amount, when, when an atom gets warmed up, this is just full basic physics, the apparent volume of the outer electrons in the shell, the, the, large, the outer shell, is, occupies an ever larger and also ever fuzzier region of volumetric space, which means that its ability to accept new electrons because semiconduction means you're passing electrons from one band to the next. That process goes down. You have interstitial molecular friction going up, and therefore you get even more heat. And it's a self-fulfilling prophecy of sorts. But there's, a, there's a thermal need called the thermal runaway effect where it simply doesn't work at all. Okay, and they already actually have that thermal runaway with even um, uh, 200 megahertz. Oh, yeah. No, if you don't cool these chips, they don't work. And this is where superconductivity comes into play. That was my next question. In other words, could that be the next leap? That is an intermediary step. And uh -huh. it's already being done now. And this is where nanotechnology comes in, by the way. But once again, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Forgive me. Now, I, I feel... This is your show, and I, and I don't want to do this, but I'm just trying to make sure that we haven't left out a crucial run in this ladder, because just to get back to the, the net part, and I'm trying to explain the financial and sort of business strategy interest in why this is going to be done, we talked about entertainment and experiential uh, conveyance as a sort of a new industry. We talked about the strategic applications of synthetic sentience and engineering rendering as a process that I would pay money to have access to because it makes me a more powerful player in the new competitive business arena of the virtual terraform. We talked about a virtual asset-based commodity socioeconomic system where the things that have the highest valuation actually are the intangibles, if you will, the, the components of this virtual terraform. And then you asked me, you said, well, Charles, what about how fast or how smart of a box do I have at home, this is where it gets interesting. Because I submit to you, this is what I thought to say before the, the break came on, that the boundary between what you have at your home and the much larger intelligence out there, that becomes ever more transparent. What you really end up with is, as I said earlier, an intelligent orifice. The local orifice has its local intelligence that can handle very compelling delivery mechanisms like that you have wonderful graphics and wonderful sound and very smart sensory systems and all the kind of stuff that allows the interface between you and it much more compelling. But the reality is that you have this huge, and I mean infinitely scalable, uh, functionality matrix out there, and all you really want to do is connect to it. And so the stuff that makes that connection process is what's being solved now. And the failure point that I was trying to explain earlier isn't so much how much pipe space we have, but it's how much fiber space there is. It's an enormous amount of fiber space. It's beyond ridiculous how much is unused even right now. It's the routers and the switchers. The telcos are panicking. I just went to a conference called the ACM 97 conference a few weeks ago. And in fact, there I saw William Perry, the Secretary of Defense, give his speech, followed by Brenda Laurel, <laughs> which was a pretty interesting combination. 
followed by the followed by the name of Dr. Maurice, who's a very well known educational specialist, followed by the commissioner of the SEC, all who gave very compelling but completely different perspective viewpoints of the same sort of like a, a gemstone with multiple facets. All right, you said the telco companies are panicking. Why? Yes. Uh, why? Because they have to invest tens of billions of dollars to drastically increase the smarts, if you will, the routing and switching capacity. The hubs are already running at maximum uh, throughput now. They're, they brown out, in fact, quite often. I know. Play this publicly, but believe me, they, that's what they're facing. All right, look, I just tried for 20 minutes to get on my own website. I, well, there you go. That's, that's a small example. <laughs> the point being that if the entire country is wired this way, and virtually all aspects of commerce and daily life are suddenly embedded in this fabric, we can't have it. And yet, the phone company's response to the FCC, who wants to get a wire into every house and every node, um, they're saying, look, all where we're going to get out of this is local access fees. We have to have some way of attaching a value-added uh, enumeration system to access uh, requests so that we can recapture our investment. And how will they do that? Well, there's a talk about a hotbed of intrigue. Uh, it's wide open. There's all kinds of ideas floating around out there. Part of why CORBA is becoming interesting is because CORBA is more than just smart data packets. These are function packets. And if I have function packets that represent stuff that I've created or stuff that I want or things that I have access to or could have access to under certain conditions, every time I activate one of these entities, there's a fee. It's like, okay, instead of going to a store and buying a disk that you put in your machine, you buy the permission to activate some functionality that's out there in this ubiquitous fabric. And that is where the sentience engines really suddenly take off. Now, I want to tell you some factual information. There's a guy by the name of Dr. Hugh Garris. I've spoken with him a few times. I'm quite familiar with his work. He's being financed by NTD, which is the, I think the second largest telco in the world, certainly the largest in Japan. Yes. His project is, I'm not kidding, building self-replicating synthetic brains. What? I am not kidding. I can send you the documents. Self-replicating synthetic, synthetic brains. Brain. He wants to build a 10 billion neuron synthetic brain by the year 25. And they're, they're well on their way. And he's like one of a, of a whole plethora of people who are looking at this process. How do you, let, let's start at the beginning. How would you build a synthetic brain? Well, in his First world, question. he's implementing the logic in silicon, but he obviously is looking towards molecular as the next transition. To me, silicon is nothing more than a clumsy container for a functionality set. Container. He's like an abandoned silicon, the happier I am. And I understand exactly where this guy is going. And I, there's other people I know who are doing the same thing. But in his literature, he talks about growing dendritic structures, growing structures that can be influenced by input stimuli, but then reorganize their branching structures so they become optimized to respond to a certain kind of stimulus set, you might say. Uh -huh. And why does the telco want to invest in this? Because rather than just building more switches and routers, they want to make the routers and switches intelligent. They want to have them use a process called adaptive resonance so they can anticipate peak load pattern sets and reconstruct themselves on the fly. Right. Through the fact of equivalent of a xenomorph. <laughs> and they're willing to spend billions of dollars on this because they will save billions of dollars. All right. Uh, Charles. Yes. How far into this uh, intelligence do we get before we reach... I mean, w would you define that if reached as sentience or not quite? Uh, there's a there's a, a big weak point there someplace. Well, if you want to design an emotional cognition engine, you can go as far back as the early 80s. One of the great minds that I bowed before, and if I ever had a chance to talk with the gentleman, I would be just in awe and beyond speech, because it's hard to imagine because I bought way so much. His name is Stefan Grossberg, and he wrote a, a very well-known book that anyone who's taken your basic ad courses would know about. It's called Neural Networks and Natural Intelligence. Buried back in the last 12, you know, 13 chapters in, suddenly he's stumbled into a really, really interesting, compelling model. He's got his version of an emotional cognition image, and it's one of several I've studied, by the way, which back in his day would have been very difficult to implement, and it certainly would have gone far beyond the computational capacity of quote-unquote traditional computers and or traditional computing languages. Uh, emotion, those things have changed a lot. Does, does emotion equal uh, self-awareness? It is a primary component. It is a way to measure that. In other words, you have to have some kind of external reference point to say, does it care? 
Does it feel? Does it want to feel? Does it have desires? Does it respond to something that it would not otherwise respond to unless it had been conditionalized by some sort of behavior that it had found an affection for? Or would, would, would that would that emotion be a, um, a, a benign thing in your opinion? Well, to totally so. But I will submit to you uh -huh. that yes, there will be some unfriendly ones and some friendly ones. That's the whole point. Yeah, let's not forget jealousy, anger, sure, uh, just plain old evil. And when I went to this year's Autonomous Agents Conference, there were several emotional cognition engines in their various states of development. I had a chat with some of the folks there. Some of them I read their papers, and finally I had a chance to shake their hands, say, hello, how are you doing? I could show them some of my notes, and we could chat over lunch, that kind of thing. But the whole point is, this is no longer like some way out there fringe thing. This is like people in labs saying, well, here's our version of how to do such and such. Now, I submit to you the following thing. I look at the whole process of computing, quote unquote, giving way to what I call a functionality matrix, uh -huh. where you have the de facto equivalent of object-oriented organelle components that can reorganize themselves to fulfill a certain kind of task or class of tasks, not that dissimilar from an actual xenomorphic organism. You take that a step further, and you suggest, look, the human body has got organs that are specialized in what they do. They work together to form the entire being, but they all have their localized metabolisms and their symbiotic codependencies on one another to right. maintain the functionality of that organism. A compute engine that's going to become an organistic-like process system would be constructed the same way. It will involve both optical, electrical, and electro-optical components, which eventually will operate at the molecular scale. And the stuff to make this possible is being solved now. Well, that's where we get to nanotechnology. Thank you very much. That was the whole point. And now, the fact that we are being fed into this unbelievably huge transitional change, the, like I said, some people have attached religious paradigms or philosophical paradigms or they're oh, looking sure. at some sort of calamity. And sure. maybe these things all line up. May, you know, I, I'm willing to entertain, by the way, I don't think we're alone at all. I think, like I said, we're a dot in somebody's map, probably a dot in a whole bunch of folks' map. Would they be interested to see us right now as we're about to cross into this next domain? Yes. Yes. Why? Because we would be dangerous. We'd be like a toddler with a loaded gun stumbling around in their backyard. Into their backyard. Into their backyard if they didn't have a sense of security about where our state of our social and spiritual health was at. Well, I'm not so sure I'm, I'm secure about it. Uh, Charles, hold on. When we sure. come back, nanotechnology... 101. I'm R. Bell, and this is CBC. This is the CBC Radio Network. It is, and I feel a little like a 386 trying to listen to a pendium. Charles Osman races right ahead. We're going to try and slow him down a little bit here for you folks um, and talk a little bit about nanotechnology. It is fascinating. All right, back now to Charles Osman. Charles, um, let's try and slow it down, and uh, let's let's give them an idea of what nanotechnology is. We've been through a pretty heavy uh, duty session here on where the net may be going. Okay, and the, the two do connect to each other, and that's why we spent off. All right, well, let's I understand that perhaps we should back away now. Just look at nanotechnology right. in its autonomous. What world. is nanotechnology? Um, it's probably one of the most misunderstood, I mean, I'm being a little coy here, but it's probably one of the most misunderstood terms and probably most poorly connected to the reality of what it actually is because it is such a diffuse and broad-ranged uh, concept. It's not just a single science or a single thing to do. It covers almost every aspect of chemistry, physics, computing, Material science, uh, medicine, uh, is, is so enormous that it's very difficult to capsulize. But I will try to offer a one-sentence glimpse uh, of a branching node from which you can then extract the different right. applications.